Volume 3, Chapter 7. These events occupied so much time that June had numbered more than half its days before we again commenced our long protracted journey. The day after my return to Versailles, six men, from among those I had left at villeneuve la gaillard arrived with intelligence that the rest of the troop had already proceeded towards Switzerland. We went forward in the same track. It is strange, after an interval of time, to look back on a period which, though short in itself, appeared when an actual progress to be drawn out interminably. By the end of July we entered Dijon. By the end of July those hours, days, and weeks had mingled with the ocean of forgotten time, which in their passage teemed with fatal events and agonizing sorrow. By the end of July, little more than a month had gone by if man's life were measured by the rising and setting of the sun. But alas, in that interval ardent youth had become gray-haired. Furrows deep and unerasable were trenched in the blooming cheek of the young mother. The elastic limbs of early manhood, paralyzed as by the burden of years, assumed the decrepitude of age. Nights passed, during whose fatal darkness the sun grew old before it rose, and burning days to cool whose baleful heat the balmy eve, lingering far in eastern climes, came lagging and ineffectual. Days in which the dial, radiant in its noonday station, moved not its shadow the space of a little hour, until a whole life of sorrow had brought the sufferer to an untimely grave. We departed from Versailles, 1500 souls. We set out on the 18th of June. We made a long procession, in which was contained every dear relationship or tie of love that existed in human society. Fathers and husbands, with guardian care, gathered their dear relatives around them. Wives and mothers looked for support to the manly form beside them, and then with tender anxiety bent their eyes on the infant troop around. They were sad, but not hopeless. Each thought that someone would be saved, each with that pertinacious optimism, which to the last characterized our human nature, trusted that their beloved family would be the one preserved. We passed through France and found it empty of inhabitants. Some one or two natives survived in the larger towns, which they roamed through like ghosts. We received therefore small increase to our numbers, and such decrease through death, that at last it became easier to count the scanty list of survivors. As we never deserted any of the sick, until their death permitted us to commit their remains to the shelter of a grave, our journey was long, while every day a frightful gap was made in our troop. They died by tens, by fifties, by hundreds. No mercy was shown by death. We ceased to expect it, and every day welcomed the sun with the feeling that we might never see it rise again. The nervous terrors and fearful visions which had scared us during the spring continued to visit our coward troop during this sad journey. Every evening brought its fresh creation of specters. A ghost was depicted by every blighted tree, and appalling shapes were manufactured from each shaggy bush. By degrees these common marvels palled on us, and then other wonders were called into being. Once it was confidently asserted that the sun rose an hour later than its seasonable time, again it was discovered that he grew paler and paler, that shadows took an uncommon appearance. It was impossible to have imagined, during the usual calm routine of life men had before experienced, the terrible effects produced by these extravagant delusions. In truth, of such little worth are our senses, when unsupported by concurring testimony, that it was with the utmost difficulty I kept myself free from the belief in supernatural events, to which the major part of our people readily gave credit. Being one sane amidst a crowd of the mad, I hardly dared assert to my own mind that the vast luminary had undergone no change, that the shadows of night were unthickened by innumerable shapes of awe and terror, or that the wind, as it sung in the trees or whistled round an empty building, was not pregnant with sounds of wailing and despair. Sometimes realities took ghostly shapes, and it was impossible for one's blood not to curdle at the perception of an evident mixture of what we knew to be true with the visionary semblance of all that we feared. Once, at the dusk of the evening, we saw a figure all in white, apparently of more than human stature, flourishing about the road, now throwing up its arms, now leaping to an astonishing height in the air, then turning round several times successively, then raising itself to its full height and gesticulating violently. Our troop, on the alert to discover and believe in the supernatural, made a halt at some distance from this shape, and as it became darker, there was something appalling even to the incredulous in the lonely specter, whose gambols, if they hardly accorded with spiritual dignity, were beyond human powers. Now it leapt right up in the air, now sheer over a high hedge, and was again the moment after in the road before us.
By the time I came up, the fright experienced by the spectators of this ghostly exhibition began to manifest itself in the flight of some and the close huddling together of the rest. Our goblin now perceived us. He approached and as we drew everentially back made a low bow. The sight was irresistibly ludicrous even to our hapless band, and his politeness was hailed by a shout of laughter. Then again springing up, as a last effort, it sunk to the ground and became almost invisible through the dusky night. This circumstance again spread silence and fear through the troop. The more courageous at length advanced, and raising the dying wretch, discovered the tragic explanation of this wild scene. It was an opera dancer, and had been one of the troop which deserted from villeneuve la -Gaillard. Falling sick, he had been deserted by his companions. In an access of delirium he had fancied himself on the stage, and poor fellow, his dying sense eagerly accepted the last human applause that could ever be bestowed on his grace and agility. At another time, we were haunted for several days by an apparition, to which our people gave the appellation of the Black Spectre. We never saw it except at evening, when his coal-black steed, his morning dress and plume of black feathers, had a majestic and awe-striking appearance. His face, one said, who had seen it for a moment, was ashy pale. He had lingered far behind the rest of his troop, and suddenly at a turn in the road, saw the black specter coming towards him. He hid himself in fear, and the horse and his rider slowly passed, while the moonbeams fell on the face of the latter, displaying its unearthly hue. Sometimes at dead of night, as we watched the sick, we heard one galloping through the town. It was the black specter come in token of inevitable death. He grew giant tall to vulgar eyes, an icy atmosphere, they said, surrounded him. When he was heard, all animals shuddered, and the dying knew that their last hour was come. It was death himself, they declared, come visibly to seize on subject earth and quell at once our decreasing numbers, sole rebels to his law. One day at noon, we saw a dark mass on the road before us, and coming up, beheld the black specter fallen from his horse, lying in the agonies of disease upon the ground. He did not survive many hours, and his last words disclosed the secret of his mysterious conduct. He was a French noble of distinction, who from the effects of plague, had been left alone in his district. During many months, he had wandered from town to town, from province to province, seeking some survivor for a companion, and abhorring the loneliness to which he was condemned. When he discovered our troop, fear of contagion conquered his love of society. He dared not join us, yet he could not resolve to lose sight of us, sole human beings who besides himself existed in wide and fertile France. So he accompanied us in the spectral guise I have described, till pestilence gathered him to a larger congregation, even that of dead mankind. It had been well if such vain terrors could have distracted our thoughts from more tangible evils, but these were too dreadful and too many not to force themselves into every thought every moment of our lives. We were obliged to halt at different periods for days together, till another and yet another was consigned as a clod to the vast clod which had been once our living mother. Thus we continued traveling during the hottest season, and it was not till the 1st of August that we, the emigrants, reader there were just 80 of us in number, entered the gates of Dijon. We had expected this moment with eagerness, for now we had accomplished the worst part of our drear journey, and Switzerland was near at hand. Yet how could we congratulate ourselves on any event thus imperfectly fulfilled? Were these miserable beings, who, worn and wretched, passed in sorrowful procession, the sole remnants of the race of man, which, like a flood, had once spread over and possessed the whole earth? It had come down clear and unimpeded from its primal mountain source in Ararat, and grew from a puny streamlet to a vast perennial river, generation after generation flowing on ceaselessly. The same, but diversified, it grew, and swept onwards towards the absorbing ocean, whose dim shores we now reached. It had been the mere plaything of nature, when first it crept out of uncreative void into light. But thought brought forth power and knowledge, and clad with these, the race of man assumed dignity and authority. It was then no longer the mere gardener of earth, or the shepherd of her flocks. It carried with it an imposing and majestic aspect. It had a pedigree and illustrious ancestors. It had its gallery of portraits, its monumental inscriptions, its records and titles. This was all over, now that the ocean of death had sucked in the slackening tide, and its source was dried up. We first had bidden adieu to the state of things which having existed many thousand years seemed eternal. Such a state of government, obedience, traffic, and domestic intercourse, as had molded our hearts and capacities as far back as memory could reach. 
then to patriotic zeal, to the arts, to reputation, to enduring fame, to the name of country, we had bidden farewell. We saw depart all hope of retrieving our ancient state, all expectation except the feeble one of saving our individual lives from the wreck of the past. To preserve these we had quitted England, England no more. For without her children, what name could that barren island claim? With tenacious grasp we clung to such rule and order as could best save us, trusting that if a little colony could be preserved, that would suffice at some remoter period to restore the lost community of mankind. But the game is up, we must all die, nor leave survivor nor heir to the wide inheritance of earth. We must all die, the species of man must perish, his frame of exquisite workmanship, the wondrous mechanism of his senses, the noble proportion of his godlike limbs, his mind, the throned king of these, must perish. Will the earth still keep her place among the planets? Will she still journey with unmarked regularity round the sun? Will the seasons change? The trees adorn themselves with leaves, and flowers shed their fragrance in solitude. Will the mountains remain unmoved, and streams still keep a downward course towards the vast abyss? Will the tides rise and fall, and the winds fan universal nature? Will beasts pasture, birds fly, and fishes swim? When man, the lord, possessor, perceiver, and recorder of all these things, has passed away as though he had never been. Oh, what mockery is this! Surely death is not death, and humanity is not extinct, but merely passed into other shapes unsubjected to our perceptions. Death is a vast portal, and high road to life. Let us hasten to pass, let us exist no more in this living death, but die that we may live. We had longed with inexpressible earnestness to reach Dijon, since we had fixed on it, as a kind of station in our progress. But now we entered it with a torpor more painful than acute suffering. We had come slowly but irrevocably to the opinion that our utmost efforts would not preserve one human being alive. We took our hands therefore away from the long grasp rudder, and the frail vessel on which we floated seemed, the government over her suspended, to rush, prow foremost, into the dark abyss of the billows. A gush of grief, a wanton profusion of tears and vain laments, an overflowing tenderness, and passionate but fruitless clinging to the priceless few that remained, was followed by languor and recklessness. During this disastrous journey we lost all those, not of our own family, to whom we had particularly attached ourselves among the survivors. It were not well to fill these pages with a mere catalogue of losses, yet I cannot refrain from this last mention of those principally dear to us. The little girl whom Adrian had rescued from utter desertion during our ride through London on the 20th of November died at Auxerre. The poor child had attached herself greatly to us, and the suddenness of her death added to our sorrow. In the morning we had seen her apparently in health. In the evening, Lucy, before we retired to rest, visited our quarters to say that she was dead. Poor Lucy herself only survived, till we arrived at Dijon. She had devoted herself throughout to nursing the sick and attending the friendless. Her excessive exertions brought on a slow fever, which ended in the dread disease whose approach soon released her from her sufferings. She had throughout been endeared to us by her good qualities, by her ready and cheerful execution of every duty, and mild acquiescence in every turn of adversity. When we consigned her to the tomb, we seemed at the same time to bid a final adieu to those peculiarly feminine virtues conspicuous in her. Uneducated and unpretending as she was, she was distinguished for patience, forbearance, and sweetness. These, with all their train of qualities peculiarly English, would never again be revived for us. This type of all that was most worthy of admiration in her class among my countrywomen was placed under the sod of desert France and it was as a second separation from our country to have lost sight of her forever. The Countess of Windsor died during our abode at Dijon. One morning I was informed that she wished to see me. Her message made me remember that several days had elapsed since I had last seen her. Such a circumstance had often occurred during our journey, when I remained behind to watch to their close the last moments of some one of our hapless comrades, and the rest of the troop passed on before me. But there was something in the manner of her messenger that made me suspect that all was not right. A caprice of the imagination caused me to conjecture that some ill had occurred to Clara or Evelyn, rather than to this aged lady. Our fears, forever on the stretch, demanded a nourishment of horror, and it seemed too natural an occurrence, too like pastimes for the old to die before the young. I found the venerable mother of my Idris lying on a couch, her tall emaciated figure stretched out, her face fallen away from which the nose stood out in sharp profile, and her large dark eyes, hollow and deep, gleamed with such light as may edge a thundercloud at sunset. 
All was shriveled and dried up, except these lights. Her voice too was fearfully changed as she spoke to me at intervals. I am afraid, said she, that it is selfish in me to have asked you to visit the old woman again before she dies, yet perhaps it would have been a greater shock to hear suddenly that I was dead than to see me first thus. I clasped her shriveled hand. Are you indeed so ill? I asked. Do you not perceive death in my face? replied she. It is strange, I ought to have expected this, and yet I confess it has taken me unaware, I never clung to life or enjoyed it, till these last months, while among those I senselessly deserted, and it is hard to be snatched immediately away. I am glad, however, that I am not a victim of the plague, probably I should have died at this hour, though the world had continued as it was in my youth. She spoke with difficulty, and I perceived that she regretted the necessity of death, even more than she cared to confess. Yet she had not to complain of an undue shortening of existence. Her faded person showed that life had naturally spent itself. We had been alone at first, now Clara entered. The Countess turned to her with a smile and took the hand of this lovely child. Her roseate palm and snowy fingers contrasted with relaxed fibers and yellow hue of those of her aged friend. She bent to kiss her, touching her withered mouth with the warm, full lips of youth. Verney, said the Countess, I need not recommend this dear girl to you, for your own sake you will preserve her. Were the world as it was, I should have a thousand sage precautions to impress, that one so sensitive, good, and beauteous, might escape the dangers that used to lurk for the destruction of the fair and excellent. This is all nothing now. I commit you, my kind nurse, to your uncle's care. To yours I entrust the dearest relic of my better self. Be to Adrian, sweet one, what you have been to me. Enliven his sadness with your sprightly sallies. Soothe his anguish by your sober and inspired converse when he is dying. Nurse him as you have done me. Clara burst into tears. Kind girl, said the Countess, do not weep for me. Many dear friends are left to you. And yet, cried Clara, you talk of their dying also. This is indeed cruel. How could I live if they were gone? If it were possible for my beloved protector to die before me, I could not nurse him. I could only die too. The venerable lady survived this scene only twenty-four hours. She was the last tie binding us to the ancient state of things. It was impossible to look on her, and not call to mind in their wanted guise, events, and persons, as alien to our present situation as the disputes of Themistocles and Aristides, or the wars of the two roses in our native land. The crown of England had pressed her brow. The memory of my father and his misfortunes, the vain struggles of the late king, the images of Raymond, Evadne, and Perdita, who had lived in the world's prime, were brought vividly before us. We consigned her to the oblivious tomb with reluctance, and when I turned from her grave, Janus veiled his retrospective face, that which gazed on future generations had long lost its faculty. After remaining a week at Dijon, until thirty of our number deserted the vacant ranks of life, we continued our way towards Geneva. At noon on the second day we arrived at the foot of Jura. We halted here during the heat of the day. Here fifty human beings, fifty, the only human beings that survived of the food-teeming earth, assembled to read in the looks of each other ghastly plague, or wasting sorrow, desperation, or worse, carelessness of future or present evil. Here we assembled at the foot of this mighty wall of mountain under a spreading walnut tree. A brawling stream refreshed the green sward by its sprinkling and the busy grasshopper chirped among the thyme. We clustered together a group of wretched sufferers. A mother cradled in her enfeebled arms the child, last of many, whose glazed eye was about to close forever. Here beauty, late glowing in youthful luster and consciousness, now wan and neglected, knelt fanning with uncertain motion the beloved, who lay striving to paint his features distorted by illness with a thankful smile. There an hard-featured, weather-worn veteran, having prepared his meal, sat, his head dropped on his breast, the useless knife falling from his grasp, his limbs utterly relaxed as thought of wife and child and dearest relative all lost passed across his recollection. There sat a man who for forty years had basked in fortune's tranquil sunshine. He held the hand of his last hope, his beloved daughter, who had just attained womanhood, and he gazed on her with anxious eyes while she tried to rally her fainting spirit to comfort him. Here a servant, faithful to the last, though dying, waited on one, who, though still erect with health, gazed with gasping fear on the variety of woe around. Adrian stood leaning against a tree, he held a book in his hand, but his eye wandered from the pages and sought mine, they mingled a sympathetic glance. His looks confessed that his thoughts had quitted the inanimate print, for pages more pregnant with meaning, more absorbing, spread out before him. By the margin of the stream, apart from all, in a tranquil nook, 
where the purling brook kissed the green sward gently, Clara and Evelyn were at play, sometimes beating the water with large boughs, sometimes watching the summer flies that sported upon it. Evelyn now chased a butterfly, now gathered a flower for his cousin, and his laughing cherub face and clear brow told of the light heart that beat in his bosom. Clara, though she endeavored to give herself up to his amusement, often forgot him as she turned to observe Adrian and me. She was now fourteen and retained her childish appearance, though in height a woman. She acted the part of the tenderest mother to my little orphan boy. To see her playing with him or attending silently and submissively on our wants, you thought only of her admirable docility and patience. But, in her soft eyes, and the veined curtains that veiled them, in the clearness of her marmoreal brow, and the tender expression of her lips, there was an intelligence and beauty that at once excited admiration and love. When the sun had sunk towards the precipitate west, and the evening shadows grew long, we prepared to ascend the mountain. The attention that we were obliged to pay to the sick made our progress slow. The winding road, though steep, presented a confined view of rocky fields and hills, each hiding the other, till our farther ascent disclosed them in succession. We were seldom shaded from the declining sun, whose slant beams were instinct with exhausting heat. There are times when minor difficulties grow gigantic. Times when, as the Hebrew poet expressively terms it, the grasshopper is a burden, so was it with our ill-fated party this evening. Adrian, usually the first to rally his spirits and dash foremost into fatigue and hardship, with relaxed limbs and declined head, the reins hanging loosely in his grasp, left the choice of the path to the instinct of his horse, now and then painfully rousing himself, when the steepness of the ascent required that he should keep his seat with better care. Fear and horror encompassed me. Did his languid air attest that he also was struck with contagion? How long when I look on this matchless specimen of mortality may I perceive that his thought answers mine? How long will those limbs obey the kindly spirit within? How long will light and life dwell in the eyes of this my sole remaining friend? Thus pacing slowly each hill surmounted only presented another to be ascended, each jutting corner only discovered another, sister to the last, endlessly. Sometimes the pressure of sickness in one among us caused the whole cavalcade to halt. The call for water, the eagerly expressed wish to repose, the cry of pain and suppressed sob of the mourner. Such were the sorrowful attendants of our passage of the Jura. Adrian had gone first. I saw him while I was detained by the loosening of a girth, struggling with the upward path, seemingly more difficult than any we had yet passed. He reached the top, and the dark outline of his figure stood in relief against the sky. He seemed to behold something unexpected and wonderful, for pausing, his head stretched out, his arms for a moment extended, he seemed to give an all hail, to some new vision, urged by curiosity, I hurried to join him. After battling for many tedious minutes with the precipice, the same scene presented itself to me, which had wrapped him in ecstatic wonder. Nature, or nature's favorite, this lovely earth, presented her most unrivaled beauties in resplendent and sudden exhibition. Below, far, far below, even as it were in the yawning abyss of the ponderous globe, lay the placid and azure expanse of Lake Lehman. Vine-covered hills hedged it in, and behind dark mountains in cone-like shape or a regular cyclopean wall, served for further defense. But beyond, and high above all, as if the spirits of the air had suddenly unveiled their bright abodes, placed in scaleless altitude in the stainless sky, heaven-kissing, companions of the unattainable ether, were the glorious Alps, clothed in dazzling robes of light by the setting sun, and, as if the world's wonders were never to be exhausted, their vast immensities, their jagged crags and roseate painting appeared again in the lake below, dipping their proud heights beneath the unruffled waves. Palaces for the naiads of the placid waters. Towns and villages lay scattered at the foot of Jura, which, with dark ravine and black promontories, stretched its roots into the watery expanse beneath, Carried away by wonder, I forgot the death of man, and the living and beloved friend near me. When I turned, I saw tears streaming from his eyes. His thin hands pressed one against the other, his animated countenance beaming with admiration. Why, cried he at last, why, O oh heart, whisperest thou of grief to me? Drink in the beauty of that scene, and possess delight beyond what a fabled paradise could afford. By degrees, our whole party surmounting the steep joined us, not one among them, but gave visible tokens of admiration, surpassing any before experienced. One cried, God reveals his heaven to us, we may die blessed. Another and another, with broken exclamations and extravagant phrases, endeavored to express the intoxicating effect of this wonder of nature. So we remained a while, lightened of the pressing burden of fate, 
forgetful of death, into whose night we were about to plunge, no longer reflecting that our eyes now and forever were and would be the only ones which might perceive the divine magnificence of this terrestrial exhibition. An enthusiastic transport, akin to happiness, burst, like a sudden ray from the sun on our darkened life. Precious attribute of woe-worn humanity, that can snatch ecstatic emotion even from under the very share and harrow that ruthlessly plows up and lays waste every hope. This evening was marked by another event. Passing through Fernie in our way to Geneva, unaccustomed sounds of music arose from the rural church which stood embosomed in trees, surrounded by smokeless, vacant cottages. The peal of an organ with rich swell awoke the mute air, lingering along and mingling with the intense beauty that clothed the rocks and woods and waves around. Music, the language of the immortals, disclosed to us as testimony of their existence, music, silver key of the fountain of tears, child of love, soother of grief, inspirer of heroism and radiant thoughts. O oh music, in this hour desolation, we had forgotten thee. Nor pipe at eve cheered us, nor harmony of voice, nor linked thrill of string, thou camest upon us now, like the revealing of other forms of being, and transported as we had been by the loveliness of nature, fancying that we beheld the abode of spirits, now we might well imagine that we heard their melodious communings. We paused in such awe as would seize on a pale votarist visiting some holy shrine at midnight, if she beheld animated and smiling the image which she worshipped. We all stood mute, many knelt, in a few minutes, however, we were recalled to human wonder and sympathy by a familiar strain. The air was Haydn's new created world, and old and drooping as humanity had become, the world yet fresh as at creation's day, might still be worthily celebrated by such an hymn of praise. Adrian and I entered the church. The nave was empty, though the smoke of incense rose from the altar, bringing with it the recollection of vast congregations in once thronged cathedrals. We went into the loft. A blind old man sat at the bellows, his whole soul was ear, and as he sat in the attitude of attentive listening, a bright glow of pleasure was diffused over his countenance. For though his lackluster eye could not reflect the beam, yet his parted lips and every line of his face and venerable brow spoke delight. A young woman sat at the keys perhaps twenty years of age. Her auburn hair hung on her neck, and her fair brow shone in its own beauty, but her drooping eyes let fall fast-flowing tears, while the constraint she exercised to suppress her sobs and still her trembling flushed her else pale cheek. She was thin, languor and alas sickness bent her form. We stood looking at the pair, forgetting what we heard in the absorbing sight, till the last chord struck, the peal died away in lessening reverberations. The mighty voice, inorganic we might call it, for we could in no way associate it with mechanism of pipe or key, stilled its sonorous tone, and the girl, turning to lend her assistance to her aged companion, at length perceived us. It was her father, and she since childhood had been the guide of his darkened steps. They were Germans from Saxony, and emigrating thither but a few years before, had formed new ties with the surrounding villagers. About the time that the pestilence had broken out, a young German student had joined them. Their simple history was easily divined. He, a noble, loved the fair daughter of the poor musician, and followed them in their flight from the persecutions of his friends, but soon the mighty leveler came with unblunted scythe to mow, together with the grass, the tall flowers of the field. The youth was an early victim, she preserved herself for her father's sake. His blindness permitted her to continue a delusion, at first the child of accident, and now solitary beings, sole survivors in the land, he remained unacquainted with the change, nor was aware that when he listened to his child's music, the mute mountains, senseless lake, and unconscious trees were himself accepted, her sole auditors. The very day that we arrived, she had been attacked by symptomatic illness. She was paralyzed with horror at the idea of leaving her aged, sightless father alone on the empty earth. But she had not courage to disclose the truth and the very excess of her desperation animated her to surpassing exertions. At the accustomed Vesper hour, she led him to the chapel, and though trembling and weeping on his account, she played without fault in time or error in note, the hymn written to celebrate the creation of the adorned earth, soon to be her tomb. We came to her like visitors from heaven itself, her high-wrought courage, her hardly sustained firmness, fled with the appearance of relief. With a shriek she rushed towards us, embraced the knees of Adrian, and uttering but the words, Oh save my father, with sobs and hysterical cries, opened the long-shut floodgates of her woe. Poor girl. She and her father now lie side by side, beneath the high walnut tree where her lover reposes, and which in her dying moments she had pointed out to us. 
Her father, at length aware of his daughter's danger, unable to see the changes of her dear countenance, obstinately held her hand, till it was chilled and stiffened by death. Nor did he then move or speak, till twelve hours after, kindly death took him to his breakless repose. But they rest beneath the sod, the tree their monument. The hallowed spot is distinct in my memory, paled in by craggy Jura and the far, immeasurable Alps. The spire of the church they frequented still points from out the embosoming trees, and though her hand be cold, still methinks the sounds of divine music which they loved wander about, solacing their gentle ghosts.